Hi, I'm Rich Ventura, the Vice President of B2B at Sony, and welcome to another episode of RV on AV. Today, I've got just a great group of speakers, not that we never have great groups of speakers, we got some great members on today's panel. Uh, we're gonna talk about a lot of great stuff around digital signage and audio and video and analytics and facial detection and recognition and sensors, uh, you name it. We're gonna have a lot of great conversations today. And, uh, maybe on a few surprise uh, topics. Uh, you never know on these. Sometimes we kind of wander a little bit and uh, talk some different things. So I'm going to introduce a bit uh, in a second the uh, panel today, but I want to remind everyone during the conversation, please, please, please post any questions you may have. Uh, we definitely want to make sure we're uh, giving you a lot of great information and, uh, and answering as much as we possibly can. Uh, so first uh, person on the panel is a great friend of mine I've known for, I think, I think we've known each other way too long. Uh, Ryan Cahoy. Uh, Ryan is a uh, chief revenue officer for In Reality. He's also a, a member of the Digital Signage Federation board. Uh, second person is uh, Tim Albright. Uh, those who know Tim, Tim, it's kind of unique. Usually he's interviewing me, and it, this is kind of the first time I've actually got to interview Tim and talk with him. It's slightly it's uncomfortable. <laughs> well, we won't make it too painful. Uh, Tim is uh, the CEO of AV Nation. He's also the chief marketing officer for one of our great integrators, and I'm going to let him talk a bit more about that as well. Uh, next on the list uh, is uh, we, we've got a great friend of ours uh, from overseas over in Amsterdam, and uh, it's been way too long since I've gotten to see Joyce. I think it's uh, been, what, a year and a half. Uh, Joyce uh, Cardona, she is the CEO of Sitecorp, and uh, you may not know, you guys may not know who Sitecore is, and you're just gonna love hearing what they do. So I'll let the, her talk in a second, talk about what they do. Welcome, Joyce. And last but not least, you know, I keep saying fourth person is batting cleanup here, and uh, uh, this is a new new partnership for me. I mean, it's great friendship for years with Sony, but this is a new one for me because I came on board, and this is Tim Boot. Uh, Tim is uh, with Meyer Sound, and he's a director of global marketing. Uh, so. All of you, first off, thank you for taking time. Uh, some it's uh, afternoon, a little towards the end of the day. Some it's a little late in the day. Uh, so I do appreciate you guys taking time. Uh, uh, we'll go around about uh, here real quick. Uh, tell people about yourself. So we'll start with Ryan. Uh, talk a little bit about yourself and your organization. Great. Thanks, Rich. Uh, so my name is Ryan Cahoy. Uh, I've been around digital signage for about 25 years now. Uh, I started with Dactronics, where I helped create products for the financial market. Think LED stock tickers. And then I spent the last 20 years with Rise Vision, which is a digital signage CMS. I left last year, and as part of my uh, departure, I took a company called Rise Display, which is a business unit that specialized in LED stock tickers and sports tickers, and, and along with that, being an AV integrator that sold digital signage. Um, I merged that into another organization, and I, I still act as the chief revenue officer there for growing the ticker business. Um, and I'm also invested in In Reality, which is a venue analytics company that uses radar sensors to measure customer engagement, uh, primarily in retail. So think of small sensors that gather traffic and impressions and dwell time, all to give retailers and brands, you know, like Google Analytics type reports for physical stores. Uh, and I'm, I'm the chief revenue officer there as well. And as Rich mentioned, I'm, I'm also on the board of directors for the Digital Signage Federation, where I, I spend most of my time on the education committee doing online courses and, you know, helping for members, by members, you know, sharing knowledge and, and expanding the industry. So that's a bit about me. Uh, I definitely appreciate the invite and look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Ryan. So Mr. Albright, like I said, it's kind of this rare, unique opportunity to, get to ask you the difficult questions. It's kind of nice I'm on this side of the camera, but tell everybody a little about your journey. I know you've got a lot of changes in the last uh, year. Yeah, uh, I, I don't have nearly as many as hats as Ryan does. Uh, I've only got two. Um, so as, as Rich mentioned, usually I'm the one interviewing him for for our folks, uh, the stuff we do at AB Nation. Uh, AB Nation TV is a media outlet, um, primarily doing audio and video content. We do have some written. Um, so we will interview interview you know Rich and and you know other folks uh, when it comes to ISC and Infocom and CDM. Um, on the other side, and, and starting the, earlier this year, uh, we also got purchased by a company called Conference Technologies, CTI, out of St. Louis. And so part of that is I'm now uh, their CMO, their chief marketing officer. So uh, during kind of my day job, I, I do the, the, the strategy and, and the, the nuts and bolts of, of kind of marketing a, an integration firm uh, out of St. Louis. We've got 27 offices uh, across uh, the, the U.S. Um, with folks like 
Tim and, and partners like Rich. So uh, that's kind of where, where I live, still doing some, some content um, for Aviation, but also uh, creating some, some really great, uh, unique stuff for CTI. Excellent. I'll make sure not too many tough questions for you, though. I appreciate that. So next on the group is, uh, is Joyce from Sitecore. And you know, like I said, those who don't know about Sitecore, it's just an amazing company to work with. And I, got to, I had some great opportunities working with Joyce in my previous life. But uh, Joyce, uh, welcome from Amsterdam. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, so I'm Joyce. I'm the CEO from Sitecore. And we are the anonymous audience data intelligence specialist since 2013. We are based in Amsterdam, like Rich said. So for me, it's now 9 p.m. at night. And uh, we are based on the Science Park, where our team focuses on creating the latest AI-driven uh, ECDU software, which we built 100% in-house and uh, is used to collect anonymized information around people in the real world and mainly used to collect information around ad performance metrics for signage or collect information around store visitor profiles. Um, yeah, we uh, work uh, mainly with the signage industry and our main product that collects information around people's ages, gender, and interests, like where they're looking, how long are they looking, is called Deep Sight. And we have it available in uh, many different ways, uh, making it uh, usable for any different type of user. Excellent, perfect. Mr. Boot, so Tim Boot from uh, Meyer Sound, uh, like I mentioned earlier, this was a new relationship for me and I, it's been great to see all the stuff that we're doing with you and uh, welcome Tim and uh, tell us a bit about uh, what you do and what Meyer Sound does. Sure, well, thanks Rich, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, yeah, my name is Tim Boot. I'm the director of global marketing at Meyer Sound. Meyer Sound's a 42-year-old live sound loudspeaker company. Um, about 10, 15 years ago, we got into uh, cinema sound systems. Uh, we've been developing studio monitoring systems over the years as well. And uh, it's, a, it's an amazing company. We've just an amazing collection of technologies and a lot of market verticals. And um, it's been a great collaboration with Sony. We did some projects together recently, which I'm happy to talk more about. Uh, and for me personally, uh, yes, I'm the director of marketing, but I'm also really just an audio guy. For 30 years, I've been doing audio. And uh, audio for video, audio live, it is, it's just, it's a blast. And um, audio is a big part of our world. So I'm really happy to be talking to everybody here. Perfect, excellent, and it's nice because I think normally when we go on these panels, you everybody talks about vi visual display. It's all displays, displays, and yeah, obviously I work for Sony, so I got to talk about displays. But everyone forgets the importance of audio, and, and if you look at the things we're talking about here, we're going to talk about audio, we're going to talk about analytics and sensors and IoT and data, all these different things. And this is the conversation I think we we should have been having years ago, and it took you know the last few years so we really started having more of these conversations and. You know, what I'm going to start a bit about is I want to talk a little bit about the 800-pound uh, the uh, grill in the corner. It's this last year and a half that we've all gone through. Uh, you know, COVID's changed a lot of things, uh, not just our jobs and our families and everything else, but the industry itself. And it's really made us all rethink things. And, you know, thinking about the last 18 months, what are those innovations that you've seen really driving in the signage space, in the AV space? Um, and there's a lot of the stuff out there that I know all of you have kind of seen different things. Um, so Ryan, I'm going to kind of start with you is, you know, what have you seen out there in these last 18 months? Sure. You know, on the digital signage CMS side of things, you know, I don't know if there's been any monumental achievements or advancements, but I think all the various platforms have incrementally gotten better and COVID made everybody get more efficient. So with all those new iterations and the software getting easier to use, it's really helped drive costs down. So I think it's making things more economical to deploy at scale, um, and which I, I think opens up a lot of new markets. And that goes hand in hand with some of the things that you know you guys are doing at Sony with smart displays, with Android built in, that type of thing. Uh, I think the other innovation that's, that's in the early stages in digital signage is the convergence with artificial intelligence, where I, I think we're going to start to see CMSs that instead of having to manually build playlists, the AI is analyzing things and recommending what should play to achieve a goal, you know, things like increasing revenue in retail or, or areas like that. Um, 
I guess a little closer to home with what I'm doing it in reality, you know, the market's appetite for getting metrics to prove what's going on is really making an impact has been a big shift with COVID. Again, the tech's getting smaller, cheaper, smarter. You know, you can build this stuff into kiosks and, you know, every fixture at this point. And, you know, I, I think we've all seen some of the challenges around cameras, just with lawyers and, and different people getting their hair up, even though, you know, nothing's invading anybody's privacy, the word camera just raises suspicion. So I think advancements in radar and LIDAR, different kinds of sensors like that have made it easier for integrators to put this into projects without the hard legal fights. Um, so yeah, that's my quick thoughts. So Joyce, it pretty much sounds like your world, huh? Exactly, exactly. And we're, the, we're at the beating heart of uh, privacy legislation over here in the Netherlands with the GDPR over here. But uh, I do agree that uh, with what you said earlier that, you know, the use of AI will definitely drive um, uh, and boost sales further in retail environments. What I'm, what I'm also seeing is that uh, during COVID, like one of the things that we did is create a new classifier in our product suite, which uh, allows for um, the CMSs to trigger content interactively and in real time based on whether or not people that are entering a store or entering a workplace environment to remind them to wear a face mask, for example. So I think a big shift of what is happening is that before people were looking at data as a way to just aggregate and get insights and you know interact for a commercial purpose. But now next, next to that, they're seeing more and more that the use of screens together with um, AI uh, computer vision type of uh, uh, technologies can also help improve communications on a security from a security point of view and then you know as COVID in some parts of the world is now going down in numbers they can just simply deactivate the use of trigger content when uh, people are wearing a face mask or not and activate in the, in the event that the Delta variant is coming up again so I think that you know, the, the use of the data is becoming much broader and uh, usable than uh, before. And I, I really like that uh, uh, that new term that it's taken. Yeah, it's amazing. You think about two years ago, the word camera freaked everybody out. And then we go into a pandemic and people are seeing cameras that are measuring temperature and saying, saying yes, you can go in or not. And I think we've, I don't want to say we've become more comfortable with it, but I think nobody's immediately running for the hills, yelling and screaming, you, you can't use a camera on me, like, like they were two years ago. Uh, so Tim, you know, you've got this unique vantage point from multitudes of areas, right? Coming, you're at an integrator, you're, you're in the press, you're interviewing a lot of us. I mean, what have you seen these last 18 months? I, I've seen an interesting uh, evolution of the commercial brands getting into homes right whether that's a commercial display it's commercial audio it's commercial video uh, and in the commercial audio realm you've got both you know the capture of commercial microphones and commercial speakers right and, and so you have you have this this shift uh and this cross section between the residential and the commercial in the us in europe um typically and and, and you guys can correct me if i'm wrong on this but but typically you have an AV integrator, right? They do residential, they do commercial, both they're, they're, they're equally comfortable in, in that realm. But in, in the US, we have this interesting divide where you either go to Cedia and you're a Cedia member and you're a, you're a residential dealer, or you go to Avixa, you go to Infocom and you're a commercial dealer. Well, now we've got these spaces, both during COVID as soon as it hit and coming out of it as we're talking about hybrid work and we're talking about more and more work from home where folks are wanting and needing and desiring commercial grade gear audio and video in their home in their home office to e equal what's in the in the office right and so whether it's a commercial dealer going into someone's home which is new and uncomfortable for them or it's a residential dealer reaching out to folks like sony and, and folks like meyer saying hey i'm not typically a dealer or i am but i would typically put in a residential display I need some commercial gear now and them feeling their way. And, and I don't think that we've seen the end of this conversation uh, nor the end of this evolution yet. I think it'll probably be probably the next year or two before kind of the dust settles and, and one 
one side may or may not, um, you know, kind of went out over over the others. You know, it's interesting before COVID happened and, you know, you'd go into like, let's use my example, my home office. I had my headphones, my laptop and a display. That's it. Yep. Now I've got a I've got a boom mic in there. I've got a 55 inch display. I've got multiple displays. I've got all kinds of things because that, that's where I spend my entire day working. It's replicated what my office would look like. And I think we're seeing so much of that happening. And and uh, it, it really is changing that conversation. Uh, it's changing a lot of things. So that's great insight. Uh, Tim, Mr. Boot. Yes. yes. Uh, and you know, I'm. Uh, we did get a question directly aimed at you already, which is pretty interesting. Um, and uh, you know, I'm going to kind of start out this question because I think it's a, it's a good lead, good start out for you. And it's a, uh, it came over from David Keene. Uh, he says some of us missed the Mon the Montreux Jazz Festival midsummer industry trips with John and Helen. Since we can't be there, what was what has Meyer learned uh, the last eighteen months about how audio can help video collaboration at the high end, not just uh, headsets? Sure, it's a complex conversation, and you know, first off, obviously, for Meyer, our core business is live sound, and the live entertainment industry has just been devastated, and it's it's tragic for everybody in the industry. It's also tragic for the audiences because people are just clamoring to get back and see live events. Uh, the good news is the Montreal Jazz Festival did continue this year is a much different experience and I uh, kudos to them for you know going forward and changing and adapting to COVID um, but really I mean what does it look like what is the you know what are we realizing over the last 18 months um, first and foremost people clamor for content and and as Tim was sort of mentioning the desire for commercial products and high level experiences in places we hadn't planned before has really come to the surface. And, you know, Rich, with our you know, collaboration, the project at Netflix, we're seeing content creators like Netflix who are, you know, creating huge amount of content and the new delivery formats into the home, the very high resolution um, content at home really does affect how we look at our business. And so, um, yeah, we've developed new technologies like Cultural Reflex. And um, yeah, I'm really, again, really excited to see where commercial AV goes. Because um, I think we also see this in the commercial space, sound for picture, um, where that's heading. Um, and again, that residential experience is increasing dramatically. And those content creators are just going like crazy and we got to accommodate their needs. No, totally. You know, it's you, you brought up the um, uh, the partnership and the project at Netflix. Um, you know, I think that was one of the like, that was the first time really my ever engagement with Meyer. And, and what was great was just seeing how you identified this challenge. that I think we've all been talking about for the longest time with, in terms of LED and overcame it. I mean, I don't know if you want to talk for just a couple of seconds about what what you guys are doing in this, because it is it truly is a, is a pretty big challenge that we've all been facing as we've seen the migration in technology. Right. Yeah, it's so, so the challenge is fundamental that large format displays and audio are a big problem, how to make it work. Historically, cinema, since the earliest, you know, iterations of sound for cinema, the sound emanated from the screen. And it's really important in kind of overall content creation, whether it's live or pre-recorded that the sound emanate from or localized to its source. Um, and that's why cinema's always had speakers behind the screen. So the dialogue comes from where the dialogue should come from. The effects come from where they should come from. It creates that overall experience that audiences have demanded. And so with the advent of these amazing displays, the, you know, the Sony C-LED display is a, just an amazing experience, but the screen's solid. You can't put loudspeakers behind the screen anymore. And people have tried to put speakers around the screen to do some phantom imaging. Uh, it just does not create the same experience. And it's humans are really good at localizing sound sources to the visual location. And um, when you screw around with that, it's just not a good experience. So we've developed a new technology and I think COVID actually allowed us to somewhat accelerate it. Um, and develop a technology that allows us to essentially bounce sound off the screen and the audience and even more importantly, the filmmakers and content creators can go back to having sound localized to the visual source. 
and that brings into harmony the visual and the audio aspects of what we do. Yeah. And it's funny because as I was like asking you the question, someone actually asked that question of what exactly you're doing. So it was perfect timing. Uh, yeah. It's like I was reading the mind of David Kane. Kind of a scary thing, right? <laughs> uh, so let's talk a bit about the world we're in now, right? We talked about the last 18 months and you know, now we're in this world where we've got companies starting to return to the office. We've got retailers opening up uh, stadiums. You know, we started, I think they were like at 20% and then 30%. And then the Texas Rangers, I think said, Nope, we're going to open up for everybody. And we're, now we're seeing the stadiums open up and uh, fingers crossed college football will all, you know, that knows who know me, I'm a near and dear to my heart. I'll be hopeful to go watch, uh, watch uh, games uh, in the fall. We still have challenges. We still have a lot of concerns. I mean, we have variants. We have all these things going on. What are you seeing how companies, whether it's signage, it's uh, malls, it's retails, it's corporate offices, I'm kind of curious of what you're seeing, how companies are overcoming or planning for this return. Um, Joyce, I'm going to kind of start with you because you're, you're starting on the head end, right? You've got the cameras and the sensors and stuff like that. What are you hearing and seeing? Yeah, so I think... Um like looking at going back to offices, like, and and the question if we're going, if everything's going back to uh, office or if we're gonna have some sort of blended situation, I think uh, in parts that will depend heavily on where you are geographically. I think a lot of parts of the world are simply not outfitted for having people work from home. So they will have to all go back to office. And what we're seeing in parts of the world like the US is a stronger demand though, like you know, places where there's a little bit more place to work from home, uh, a strong demand, for example, for the use of analytics and AI tools in conference rooms. So uh, they wanna understand uh, how many people are in a conference room and uh, are they engaged in a meeting or not? And use that information then for different uh, end purposes. But then next to that, what we're seeing is a more streamlined, a streamlined form of communication across, for example, banks that uh, want to streamline communication to their customers as well as to their employees throughout screens inside the uh, buildings for the employees and a more unified way of communicating across all the different screens. and then using the information that they get from our type of sensor information to trigger content that's more suitable probably for their uh, profiles and uh, making sure that there is a deep level of engagement. And then next to that, all of that data gets feeded into more and more like platform sandboxes, if you will, uh, where um, also send, uh, like radar sensor technologies gets feeded into a to actively inform employees on availability of uh, meeting rooms, et cetera. So really going to a more smart building type of uh, environment. Okay. So Ryan, uh, you know, you, you brought up and, and it's, it's, it's almost like you and Joyce just kind of can play off each other. It's, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. You were talking already about the importance of AI. And I know we've talked about, you know, predictive content, predictive signage, things like that. Is our companies really trying to do that right now? Or are we still kind of playing the game of getting us to a point where we can do stuff like that? I think we're still playing the game of, can we do stuff like that? I think people are starting to experiment with it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I haven't seen as much in the corporate side because I, I think their first question is going to be, what's the ROI on something like that? In the retail side, it's easier to put an ROI on it because if I'm using sensors to gather data and I'm using AI to change the content and you know let's use a simple example when it rains outside i'm going to advertise umbrellas when it's hot out i'm going to advertise ice cream that kind of thing you know we've all seen the case studies where okay that drives increased revenue and that's what they're all there for so i think ai plays a, a big part there um, i think when you look at the corporate side you know returning to offices i think in general there's a lot of people that are hesitant in or resistant to returning to the offices. So it's going to be interesting how companies embrace that balance. And, you know, I, I think a lot of companies are looking at downsizing their spaces instead of people having dedicated offices and desks. It's going to be more on a reservation basis. And that's where digital signage comes in of, you know, like Joyce said, you know, showing what's open, showing what's available, 
But going a step beyond that is creating that sense of community. Because if people aren't in the office and they're not all around the water cooler talking and sharing things, you know, the digital signs, a way for them to communicate or, you know, what the next social event is, you know, ways to get the word out. And I think it'll also play, you know, really heavily into the tech for collaboration in the spaces because, you know, I, I think we're at the point where on any given day, if you're holding a meeting, everybody's probably not in the office and you're always going to have to video conference somebody in. So how do you leverage that tech as well? So, you know, when I, when, when I look at the office side of things, I'd say offices are going to be smaller with more technology. When I look at the retail side of things, I think that the retail is going to be smarter. It's going to be more sensors and it's going to be trying to gather more data because marketing is going to demand it. They want to see the impact. They're used to the metrics they've been getting off their websites and they want and they're going to demand that same data inside the store. Yeah, definitely. So Tim, you know, wearing your, uh, your CMO hat for, you know, for CTI, it was a great integration partner of Sony's. You know, one of the things I've been really interested in hearing and seeing is uh, with this RTTO and us coming back into these offices is things like the sensors and the analytics uh, measuring the usage in conference rooms. So I think that's our big concern, right? Making sure you don't have too many people in the room, social distancing, things like that. What what are you seeing from that side of uh, your, 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 your many roles? What are you seeing from that side of it um, going forward? It's it, it is part of it is is making sure that we don't have too many people in 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 the rooms, but it's also seeing which rooms are actually being used, uh, mm -hmm. and that's a, an analytic that we can take back to our customers, right? The folks that are putting these these systems in, and we can say, you know what, this this room here is being used constantly. It is consistently uh, being scheduled. It is consistently being occupied. This one over here is not, or or hardly. What's the differences, right? What's the technology in the different in, in between the two rooms? What is the HVAC difference between the two rooms? The average temperature, things of that nature, and kind of figure out what's how we we differentiate between the two and figure out why is this one being used and this one not, and then duplicate or, or replicate um, in the the one that's not being used as much. The other part of that um, is also as we're getting back to the office, is making sure and, and maintaining a safe cleaning schedule, right? So you're, you're, you're scheduling, you know, the, the, the meeting at noon. Well, it's scheduled for an hour and a half. Well, between 1.30 and 2.30, let's block that off automatically uh, for a cleaning crew to come in and sanitize everything and then go ahead and schedule uh, at two o'clock. So it's, it's a couple different moving pieces here where, you know, utilizing analytics, using, uh, utilizing a little bit of automation where if, if one thing happens, then the next, and then the other part is, you know, giving that feedback to when we do the next iteration or the next update, which as we are getting back to the office, returning to the office, a lot of customers are saying, hey, can you help us get these systems back up and running uh, that haven't been working for, or haven't been on for a year? Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, hey, that's oh. yeah. yeah. I was right. going to say, if I could add one thing that, you know, one thing that's interesting with technology, especially sensors, you know, you're talking about the cleaning side of things, instead of scheduled cleanings, let's use restrooms, for example, instead of deploying, you know, every hour somebody to clean it, when you put a sensor there and you know the actual usage, you could set thresholds that say after 15 people use the restroom, clean it, which there's, you know, a lot of efficiencies for an organization because let's say not very many people are in the office. Why clean it every afternoon or, or every hour, that kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And you, and you, you know, definitely. And I think that's, uh, unless we got CDC guidelines saying you got to do it this way, you know, how do you, how do you operate smarter? And I think, you know, Tim, one of the things you touched on was really, really important as everyone's forgetting is we have tech in these buildings that may or may not have been powered on for the last year to year and a half. Yep. And, right. And Part of that is is a lot of integrators and, and CTI is, is no different, but there's there are a number of integrators who can leverage asset management software, right? Um, whether it's it's their own or it's 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 off the shelf, or some different you know some combination of both. And you, you can come in there as as the techs, as the AV uh, pros, go in there, put the system through its paces, right? Power it on, see what happens. You know, clean the system certainly, but put it through its paces. But also then. Uh, leverage some of these remote uh, asset management software systems that then allows your AV integrator to constantly monitor and maintain your system. So when you are don't have anybody there, they can constantly be monitoring it and say, oh, hey, this piece of equipment isn't responding to a, a network ping. 
let's power it down. Let's power cycle it, right? And let's make sure that, that it's up and running because come seven o'clock, eight o'clock on Monday morning, that means that, that that's when your systems st have to start working. And so this monitoring software also helps as we're getting back to, to the office and getting back to work and getting those systems back up and running. No, definitely. So, so Tim, you mentioned the this importance of uh, audio in boot. And it's an area that, you know, Yes, Sony has an audio component to it, but I, I, I have, I'm just like you, you. Your world is audio. My world's been video. Yeah. Uh, what are you seeing from the audio side with these companies coming back to return to office? Um, I mean, there's got to be just a, there are so many different ways they're trying to figure out how they're going to use audio now. Absolutely, and I, I, we actually saw an uptick of this before COVID. It, the large tech companies were putting a lot more investment into their event spaces the customer insight centers, the customer experience centers, um, the way they collaborate. I mean, here we're talking, we're collaborating this way, but a lot of the tech companies were collaborating with their internal staffs um, through kind of, you know, sophisticated broadcasts for some time. And yeah, I think the realization that all that matters, the quality of the video, the quality of the audio, um, we've had this buzzword in our industry of immersive. Uh, we like to immerse people in audio. Um, so while yes, it's I think it's on a little audio is seen secondary to to video. Uh, we accept our position, but um, it, it is corp the corporate environment in particular is really seeing the value of high quality audio experience. There's high quality experiences in general, whether again whether it's their employees or their customers. Well, I think we have an expectation now, right? We're working from home. I think. Uh, I was talking, I think on the panel, we were talking yesterday and um, one of the comments someone made was like the most important piece of technology that got them through COVID and everything else, noise canceling headphones. Yeah. The quality of audio has just dramatic. And I mean, I, I it's amazing. You don't realize just how important that is until you're at this level. And then now think about these, there's gonna be an expectation when, when employees go back to the office, they're gonna have an expectation. Their internet's gotta be fast, their video's gotta be clean and clear, and their audio's gotta be good. And it's not just the That's audio. they've had at home. Yeah, it's not just the audio, it's the acoustics too. I mean, we yeah. we, we create acoustic te technologies as well. And it, it, it matters in just the general office space. You know, creating these environments where people can work comfortably, communicate with one another, Mm -hmm. um, you know, creating technologies where you're not burdened by the technology. You know, we still have a demand for in the corporate space, just like in the live space of being able to present to large groups of people, you mm -hmm. know, being able to work in audio systems and also acoustic systems that, again, remove some of those technical burdens we've had in the past so you can connect with people. And I think one of the things we really learned from COVID is that our ability to connect with people has been really challenged. I was lucky to go back into the factory myself for the first time yesterday. And it's the first time I'd seen a lot of my colleagues in 3D. And we've forgotten how important that type of collaboration is. And so as we create these new spaces or update existing ones, being able to have this in-person collaboration is so critical. And um, yeah, reducing many of those technical hurdles we've had in the past, I think is, is yeah. really the direction we need to go. Yeah, it's um, it's amazing how much we've all missed, as you said, that 3D engagement with one another. Yeah. Um, as, as I said, you know, we've had the in-person aspect of our event the last couple of days and having some of these meetings and talking to customers and partners. And I saw people I haven't seen in two years. Yeah. And but I've seen them on video and I'm like, well, that's great. We can see each other face to face. You could sit a stand across from each other six feet apart and talk about business or how we can help one another. That's the piece I think we've all been missing. And, and it's gonna be interesting to see how com how quick companies adopt new ways to engage when they do return to the office. Uh, and you know, I, and, I, and I really wonder, and, and as we look at uh, um, the future, we've got to really think about what, you know, what is that gonna look like even a year from now? Are we, you know, two years from now, three years from now, what that engagement is going to look like. But I think before we talk about the future, let's talk a little bit also about the current, and that's really around verticals. Um, we hear, I think every one of us in the in business hears, this vertical is recovering faster than that vertical, and this is one you got to focus over here. Or, this application is, is key for that. And I think one of the things I, I'm just kind of curious from all of you is, uh, 
what are you seeing or what are those verticals that are impacting your business or you're seeing that faster recovery uh, happening? And, you know, I'm going to start with uh, uh, Joyce and, and I, I got a feeling I know part of the answer, just knowing her background, but it'd be interesting to see what are you seeing from, from those verticals and applications that are, that are uh, coming quicker than others? I think like in retail, like the supermarkets are doing very well and are investing heavily in tech and then mainly in um, using views from uh, people looking looking at ads and their uh, ages, like pretty much their demographical profiles as a way to transact on a more of a performance-based level like you would in an online environment. Like Ryan has been saying a couple of times, uh, the way that data can be used for um, uh, offline uh, purposes uh, from radar and computer vision technologies is very, very similar to how people have been using data in the online ad space for over 15 years now. And I think in the supermarkets, we're really seeing um, them starting to use views and OTSs and demographical breakdowns as a way to trade with uh, advertisers so um, um before you would just show an ad in loop as a brand and now based on the requirements from a specific uh, brand their ad can be shown uh on the on the moment that their requirements are being met in real time and then based on the amount of how many actual views that uh, ad has pulled uh the uh brand will be charged an x and it's uh will be a lot more valuable to them to just than just broadcasting randomly to whomever. So that's something that I'm really seeing growing in the upcoming period a lot. And I'm very excited by that too. Yeah, and I think we talked earlier, it's, um, I think uh, Ryan said it, it's it's that ROI, it's ROO. It, they need all that stuff, right? And that's, yeah. your, that's I think we're gonna see even more of it. Um, it'll be really interesting, really interesting to see what level brands do their engagements in their, act, in their actions versus uh, stores, right? So seeing like how much will craft invest into something like that versus say a Walmart um, for those yeah. activations. So it'll be really interesting to see how that changes. Tim, uh, also, Albright, what are you, oh yes. What else? Were you I, think they're, no, I just wanted to say like, I think they're like the start of it all. I think what we're gonna be seeing okay. as everything's gonna reopen, we'll see the same happening at stadiums and at other venues as they recover. But supermarkets have been the only ones that have been open throughout this horrible period. So I think that's a trend we're gonna be seeing throughout. Yeah, no, I actually had an integrator uh, who was here yesterday was like, I'm so ecstatic about supermarkets. They're spending money, they're doing things, they're trying all these things. Mm. They're really bullish on supermarkets. So it was really interesting to hear you say the same thing. So, so Mr. Albright, uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to wear both hats on, that, on this question because you're, yes, you're seeing it from both sides. I mean, what are you seeing on the verticals? So I would agree with you on, on the, 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 the uh, grocery stores and, and the stores like that, the supermarkets, uh, because they're the, ones with, they're the ones with capital. Uh, and they're the ones who didn't shut down last year. So they've got a little bit of edge uh, and, and some 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 capital that, that they have over their cohorts and let's say, you know, hospital other parts of hospitality, restaurants and hotels. Um, so they've got a, a little bit of runway there and not quite funny money, but money that they can spend that their, their, other, their other folks can't. Um, education is a huge one. And I know that you guys all probably understand that education is, is, is consistently big. But in the U.S., you've got a number of, of platforms and, and programs that the government, uh, both with CARES Act 1 and CARES Act 2, there's, there's a large chunk of money there and a large chunk of revenue available to, uh, uh, to education houses, both K-12 as well as higher education. Not all of it has been spent. Not all of it has been doled out. And so there's still opportunities there in education. Uh, and, and the final one, I would say, is, is corporate. As corporate America gets back to work, gets back in the <laughs> office, there is that that tendency to say, okay, um, either this hasn't worked in a year or this hasn't been turned on in a year, take it all out, right? Take it all out and just let's let's start fresh or let's repurpose this. Let let's you know we are going to be making our conference rooms <clears throat> bigger physically with less with less uh, chairs. How do we do that? We, we are taking our huddle spaces and converting them into hotel spaces, right? These are not two or three room um, huddles anymore. They're one person hotel spaces 
for when the person who typically works at home does finally come into the office? How do we convert that? And how do we use those the systems that we have to you know repurpose that, that equipment and put it back in, in those new hotel spaces? So, Mr. Cahoy, I mean, we, we know retail. We kind of heard retail. We've heard hotel spaces. We've heard in education. What else? What other markets are you seeing uh, or applications, for that matter, that uh, we're seeing a lot of focus on? Yeah, you know, I, I think retail is, a little, is growing, but it's still a little bit slower because they're trying to find their pace. Uh, I see some of the same with education. I mean, they do have money, but they also have a lot of uncertainty, you know, as COVID's respiking here in the U.S. and that. So I think they're still a little hesitant to spend. Um, like taking a little different angle than the, the market verticalization, like when you look at it from a um, integration standpoint, I think the smart integrators are really evaluating their businesses and they're focusing their business on verticals, you know, especially the ones that, you know, over the last few years have just said the generic, I do digital signage or I do signage, those kinds of things. You know, I, I think it's becoming more important for them to be specific because I think the clients are getting more demanding. I think they're getting smarter and they really want to work with client or, or integrators and partners that specialize in working with clients just like them. So, you know, it's it's one thing to go work with an integrator that says I do signage. It's another to say I do digital menu boards or I do wayfinding or I do retail experiences. So I, I think the trend is businesses in general are specializing. More. Okay. Okay. So. Mr. Boot, yeah, we miss any verticals you guys are seeing uh, opportunity growth. I do have a side question for you, but I want to see your thoughts. Yeah, on yeah no, I, as well. I think you know, as actually I was listening to this, and I was uh, we we don't necessarily make products to go into grocery stores, and I kind of wish we did. Uh, people <laughs> are more than happy to spec our products. We make products that would work in a grocery store, but it's probably not the first choice. But uh, um, but I, I think House of Worship is yeah. House of Worship tends to do yeah. I'm, Unfortunately, House of Worship is a is a is a market that survives through times of crisis. Um, so the House of Worship market's been doing pretty well. Um, the pent up demand for live entertainment is there. I mm -hmm. mean, it, it, it's it's definitely people desperate to go back and see concerts and sporting events and and all the things they're used to. Um, so the demands there, it's just how how quickly that recovers. And if any of you guys have a crystal ball. I'd be happy to, to to borrow it for a while because it's um, the band's there. Is, is it here today? It's not quite here. But yep. It's coming. You know, it is, and um, you know, we'll talk in a minute here just about some of the stuff we are going to see from a crystal ball perspective or ideas that we think are going to happen. But uh, you know, Tim, an interesting question that came up, and, and it was I was kind of funny when I was looking at it. I started thinking about my history and working in retail when I was much younger, uh, and I had a full head of hair. Uh, don't laugh. I did at one point. Uh, one of the things I was thinking about was uh, how audio was kind of the, the, the stepchild because companies would just loop the same audio over and over and over again. And your employees would hear the same audio over and over again. And some employees would, would snip wires. Some would turn things off. Um, what what are those what's what's happening with audio to help us get beyond that and get you know something that allows us to do things like you know programmatic audio or changing the audio or our audio that's being sent by triggers all these things what are some things that were that's being done out there to help with it? Well, first off, and I apologize, there's a little noise in my background, but um, first off, I said earlier that you know we're kind of we we know our place of audio relative to video. Um, of course, I think audio is the most important thing in the world. And we've actually, to be fair, we've done, you know, the industry's done quite a lot of research to know that audio is likely more than 50% critical. It's just the, the, you know, as people are generally more aware of visual experiences and audio experiences tend to be a little bit more in the background, mm -hmm. but the science is there to say it's as critical, if not more critical. And I think we're also, we know that our tolerance for poor quality in audio and faults is, is it's, it's really not very good. I mean, you go to a live concert, there's one, you know, one second of audio failure, everybody remembers it. Um, and, you know, background noises, um, low quality telephones, 
it's we're not able to put our finger on why we we don't like poor quality audio experiences, but we know when they're good. And yeah. so there is just a, yeah, there's certainly a I would say in the background there's a trend to continue to increase audio quality um, in everything. We'd love to see it in these types of environments, you know, just talking like this, having better quality audio. Um, yep. It is, I, and I think, you know, you, you mentioned just the, the kind of droning in the background. It's, we got to get away from that. We've got to use audio. I think also as a, as a commercial tool, we need to start using audio to draw attention. You know, I, I'm not as experienced in, industry as some of the folks here on the call are, but using audio to draw your attention to the message that you're trying to create visually is incredibly powerful. I talked about the localization earlier. You know, if you can bring, if you have a visual message and you can bring someone's attention through audio to that visual message, that's an incredibly powerful thing. That's how humans work. We hear the bird chirp, we look at the bird, right? That's how humans work. So. A lot of the de technology, the innovation we can see, I think, will be about increased quality, but also that localization of audio. Cool. So, time for crystal ball, and thinking about what we're going to see. I mean, we got, you know, fingers crossed, legs crossed, everything we can possibly cross. We have events coming up soon. We have Cedia coming up. Uh, you've got NAB. We've got Infocom. Eventually, we hopefully we see ISE in uh, Barcelona next year. You've got the National Retail Federation show, CES, not too far away, and we all forget CES is also out there. What are some technologies or advancements that you're hoping we'll get to see in these next you know six nine months that are probably going to impact uh, the world that we all are working in today? Uh, maybe I'll start with you, Joyce, uh, since we got. Uh, Amsterdam's are no, Amsterdam. We've got Barcelona coming, and that's always been the big kickoff for the AV space. I mean, what are you? What do you think we're going to see? Ah, uh, yeah, good question. Uh, I hope we're going to see um, uh, more. To be honest, I haven't really given it a lot of thought. Like what we're going to see, like what. Um, yeah, what, what I think we're going to be seeing is hopefully a lot of actual hands, handshakes, a lot of in-person <laughs> <laughs> uh, in, in deal making. And uh, I think like my ideal scenario coming from a data and analytics uh, point of view would be that I think the ecosystem around the uh, digital signage and like what drives the content side of things and what what's what drives the analytical and data side of things is coming more and more together and uh i see uh, a bigger level of understanding across uh the in the digital signage industry of the added values that data brings and programmatic advertising, all of that, but also uh, on the advertiser side, uh, they're starting to see the added values of um, displaying ads on screens much and much more bit than before. The whole uh, ad blocker stuff online is definitely a big helper there and making it more accessible for advertisers to display content across a increasingly and rapidly growing amount of screens really everywhere around you um, definitely will help drive that uh, growth further. So what I'm hoping to see is a um, very well informed uh, ecosystem that likes to collaborate together and sees that, that working together really will drive this growth further. Yeah, I hope, you know, and I hope with, I hate to say it this way, but the downtime we've all had because you haven't been traveling, you haven't been doing these things. I think it's fostered a lot of creativity in ideation, especially in these software companies and the AI firms and the camera companies and everything else. So it's going to be really interesting to see. Uh, you know, I mentioned uh, yesterday in the panel I had, I was picking on Joey D'Angelo because one of the things he kept saying is he's got a screen with a million apps on it. He needs to see things come together. Yeah. And that's what you're talking about is how do we get all these great ideas, these cameras, yeah. these sensors, and, uh, and we bring it all together. And I think that's, I think that's going to be a, a key as we look at these next six months, nine months, a year from now, uh, it'd be really key to see what happens. Absolutely. So, uh, Mr. Albright, sir, 
Yes. Uh, what kind of great what kind of great things do you think we're going to see? Uh, there, there's two things, and they both involve uh, kind of the, the something that Ryan was talking about, and that's the AI part of, of the digital signage space. Uh, one is uh, we're getting into the the the, the kind of the um, uh, development of uh, AI driven commercials and content, right? And, and some of that is, is basically driven by not only the, the, the computer parts of this, but also streamlining uh, and, and getting out of the way and getting some of the creatives kind of stream, streamlining to where we are, you know, um, you're, you're, you know, Ryan mentioned, I'm going to show an ad that's, you know, for, for, you know, umbrellas when it's raining, right? So how do we do that programmatically? And how do we do that with AI? The other thing that is, 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 is equally as interesting and maybe a little bit more interesting to me and that is more opt-in kind of customer driven um content based around apps uh a number of years ago we were talking with the bass pro shop uh company and they say they get anywhere between three to four million visitors per store per year what i see coming down the pipeline and i've seen this a, a little bit is as a customer of let's say bass pro shop I download the app and I opt into their system. Well, am, if I'm in the store, I've opted into their to their app, then they kind of know that I'm there, right? And because I've logged in and I have an account, they know who I am. So that as I walk by display X, Y, or Z, then they could probably, you know, serve up an ad that's relevant to me, a, a middle-aged guy, as opposed to, you know, my, my kids who are more in the teen years. Um, that's really interesting, and it goes to the to the heart of delivering relevant content from the advertiser standpoint and from the consumer standpoint, because they're serving me up something that I'm interested in already, or I'm likely to be interested in, and so therefore that content then it is valuable to me. That's something I'm also going to be watching. Okay, cool. So Tim, Boot, what yeah. do you think? Uh, we gonna have some uh, crazy audio solutions out there, some speakers well, floating in the air. I mean, what do you think? Well, first off, I was like, you know, I think the first question is, what are we, what are we gonna see at trade shows? I hope we see customers. Uh, <laughs> oh, I do too. I really hope for that as well. I really, I mean, it's like we're we're going all in. We're going to Infocom. We're going to all these shows, and we got new products in the show, and we're excited about it. And uh, but we really want to see customers. It's that we go to trade shows to meet customers, understand what their problems are present our solutions. So that's that's what I really want. Um, I think the thing actually you're you're not going to see at the trade show, but also we're going to see in the industry is creative innovation and storytelling. So we, we've had we've had 18 months of creative folks in any market or whatever, you know, pent up creative energy and people have found new ways to tell stories in the last 18 months that uh, you know, I've said it, um, probably copying others, you know, we're gonna get back to the roaring 20s in terms of artistry, creation, storytelling. And I think there's a huge opportunity for us. So we might not see that at the trade shows, but we're gonna see that in, in the times to come. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, yeah, just in general in audio, um, you know, increasing quality. Um, a lot of companies like ourselves, we focus on compact solutions. It's actually something that's important in the world. Live entertainment is driven by video. Production is driven by video. A lot of it is how big can you make the screen? Where do the loudspeakers go? Um, so having the benefit of compact, high power loudspeaker systems, something we're good at, um, we're gonna see a lot of that. So, uh, you know, so the audio does play well with video and vice versa. Excellent. Mr. Cahoy. This one sucks to go last. You guys took all the good answers. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I think um, you know the, the one thing that I'm really hopeful for is the supply chain gets back to normal. So there's actually Amen, stuff out there because that's Ugh. that's been painful for everybody. But you know, to I guess kind of expand upon what Joyce said, um, I hope this is finally the year where people want to measure the results of what they're doing. Like instead of I put up a display, how's it going? I think it's great, right? Like put in a sensor, actually how much traffic, how much impressions. I, I feel COVID has accelerated that because marketing has really had to understand as they drove everything to their websites, how all that worked. And I just feel there's going to be a demand in every physical space, not just retail to where somebody's saying there's a KPI tied to everything we're spending money on, technology included. And people are going to 
going to want those sensors out there. And I, I think technology advancements, you know, they're, they're getting cheaper, they're getting smaller, the connectivity is getting better, it's easier to configure, is going to make that a reality. So that, that's what I'm really hoping for in the coming year. Well, the way I always end every one of these RVs and AVs, and eventually I'm going to have to stop doing it because we'll hopefully be further and further away from uh, COVID, is I always like to hear like a technology gadget, a device, or something that during these during the pandemic, whether for business or personal, really changed your life. I've heard everything from air fryers to uh, tablets to Microsoft Teams to noise canceling headphones. Uh, so it's always interesting to hear what uh, each one of you uh, want to go with. And so I'm going to start with Tim Boot, and uh, you know what's that gadget, device, or whatever that's uh, that you used? I well, I was afraid you'd pick on me first, but I'm just going to go with the bicycle. Um, You're not the first to say that. I've actually had others say that. It's it's. That's I used great. to race. I used to race bikes in the '90s, and my son's gotten to an age he started racing bikes. And I think, you know, I I come from a background of production. I like to, you know, we used to actually stand up and walk around stadiums and make sound and make shows. And we haven't had a chance to do that in the last 18 months. We sit at our desks and look at computer screens all day. Um, getting on a bike is amazing. So, um, yeah, I think that's really critical. Excellent. Mr. Albright. I'm going to take a, a, a page off of Tim and say mine are my, my new running shoes I discovered called Hoka Ones. I had never heard of them before in my life. Uh, and as a middle-aged man who's got some cranky uh, knees, uh, went through a, a fitness challenge, my change myself, and discovered it's probably the best pair of, of tennis shoes I've ever had in my life. Um, and they're ginormous and squishy. And when I run, uh, it doesn't hurt uh, at least as much. Well, uh, you know, Mr. Albright, one thing I will say, I've been very proud watching you through your journey, and it's been great seeing it. So that's and awesome. And yours, dude. Joyce. Yeah, I've got an indoor version of the bike, a home trainer. <laughs> it you get a Peloton? Here. What? Did you get a Peloton? No, like the cheapest one. To have. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's all good. It's very it good. I lost, I lost like 10 kilograms. So like I, I didn't get fatter throughout COVID. So that's good. Yeah. All right, Mr. Kahoy, what was that gadget of yours? You know, what's funny is I finally broke down and bought an Apple watch. You know, I had more to watch for years and it made me play with all the fitness apps and the different things that are on there. So I, I found it interesting to play with a piece of technology that probably if it weren't for COVID, I, I would have never messed with it. Well, well, you know, it's always great listening about the journeys and all the things we've done. And, and you know, I, once again, I want to thank all four of you. Uh, you know, it's been uh, an awesome conversation. Uh, the thing I love about this is these conversations should never end right here. So everyone, please engage with all these individuals. It's a great opportunity. There's a lot of great feedback out there. I know every one of these people are active in social media, LinkedIn, and speaking at events. If you see them at an Infocom, you see them at Cedia, uh, ISC, you name it. Grab them and say, hey, you know, I heard you talk uh, on the RV and AV. I'd love to learn more about what you do and how we can work with you. So once again, uh, you know, Ryan, Tim, Joyce, Tim, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we will be uh, going back to our regu regular scheduled RVs on AV here uh, in uh, the next month or so. So look for a uh, future one. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. For having us. Thank you.